to stand for scripture reading. Today's scripture is found in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, and I will be reading from the King James Version. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. You may be seated. Good morning, family. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. And it is my joy and my privilege to introduce our speaker this morning, who probably needs no introduction. Dakota Day uh, has uh, done an evangelism series right here for this church two years ago. And so probably most everybody knows him. Uh, Dakota has been married to Anna for 10 years now. She is wonderful, isn't she? <laughs> and uh, Dakota has been a, a, an amazing facts evangelist for seven years. Now, we all know, don't we, that seven is the number of completion. But don't think about it. <laughs> Dakota, I'm sure the Lord has a powerful message that he has put on your heart. We're looking forward to looking at the deceptions of the enemy. So welcome to the Folsom Group pulpit. Testing one, two, three. What about now? It's working now? Okay, all right. I must have, must have been on my end. <laughs> all right, well, good morning. It's a blessing to be back here in Folsom. Uh, we got to visit a couple of weeks ago, and now I'm back uh, just to be able to share the Word of God with you guys, and I'm super pumped and excited about what God has laid on my heart and, and what we're going to be studying in His Word this morning together. Uh, you can see the title of the message is titled, The Sham God, Satan's Personation of Christ. Now, how many of you are familiar with the, with the concept that Satan is going to personify Christ in the last days? How many of you have heard this or are familiar with this? The vast majority of us in here are. There may be some of you here today that have, may not have heard of this before, but you're about to hear about it today. And for those of you watching online, it might be the same. You might have never heard of this before, but this is going to be the first time you're going to hear it. But uh, we're going to be doing a wonderful Bible study uh, going deep, and I'm going to do some preaching this morning. Who says Amen. I, I'm a preacher at heart, not a teacher, so I like to preach the Word of God. I get excited. So if you don't get excited, I hope that my excitement rubs off on you just a little bit this morning uh, before we, we dive in. But let's go to God in prayer. It's always my custom before we open the Word of God that we go to God in prayer. We ask for His Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and to convict us of what is truth. Who says amen? amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning, to study your word, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, this morning we realize we are just men and women. We have no possible power of ourselves, no intellectual understanding apart from you, Lord. We need you at every, in every moment of our day. And we ask for you to be with us now. That you'll convict our hearts, Lord. You would send us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. That, God, you would change us from the inside out. And that, Lord, as we are diving into the subject of the sham God, Satan's personation of Christ that is coming in the future, Lord, your word warns us of this great deception, this crowning act that is coming upon planet Earth. Many of us are even unaware of it. Some do not know how to even talk about it in the Bible. But, Lord, as we dive deep into your word and as we study some of the greatest deceptions the devil has coming, Lord, I pray you will help us to be not confident in ourselves, 
not dependent upon ourselves and our own knowledge. And Lord, especially me, as your minister, Lord, I don't want to be dependent upon my words, what I have studied or what I have put together. Lord, if there be anything that I am up here to share that is not in your will, that is not supposed to be said, Lord, I pray that you will change my heart and my mind on the spot, that only your words will be preached, only the truth will be declared, that God, you might be glorified, and that your people will not be led astray as we near the close of time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The sham God. You might be wondering, man, what in the world? Where did you get this term sham God from? Well, how many of you are familiar with the game of basketball? I grew up playing basketball. Basketball was a big part of my childhood. I used to live, eat, sleep, breathe basketball all the time. Uh, me and my brother Ryan, we grew up and we played all of the time together. We would, we would play in the rain, in the sleet, in the snow. It didn't matter what it was. We were basketball like fanatics, you could say. Uh, and uh, growing up, there was a, a movement that took place in the late 90s, but really in the early 2000s is really when it really started to kick off. And it was the movement of street ball. Does anyone remember the street ball movement? You might remember going to, to Walmart. If you remember back in the early 2000s, and you would see almost in every, the men's section of Walmart, you would see a brand called And One. Anyone remember seeing this brand, And One? This is the brand, this was the street ball brand. And uh, there were some famous street ballers, and, and street ball, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's basketball, but it's a lot more fun. Because you have a little bit less, uh, you know, I guess you could say tension in the rules and all of that, and you can dribble more freely. You could do street ball moves. And um, I, I would show you some moves here, but uh, i got to be careful because uh, I don't want to be falling down and looking foolish in front of everyone, uh, messing up some of the rules. But we used, to, we used to do street ball moves in front of everyone, and uh, the idea of street ball was to make your opponent think that you're going to do something, but in reality, in your mind, you have something else completely in mind. You could call it deception. And street, in street ball, deception was the, the whole point of the game. You want to deceive your opponent, your defender, who's guarding you, into making you think you're going one direction, but really you're going another direction. And in street ball, you have, we, we did what we called breaking your ankles. Now, it's not literally breaking people's ankles, but it was when your defender thought you were going this way, but then you shift directions real fast, and then they try to make up for it, but they get this buckle effect. You see that right there? It's almost like, oh, yeah, like Elvis used to do, right? They would get this buckle effect where they try to go this way, but then they realize, oh, no, I messed up. He faked me out, and now he's going this way. And you try to make up for it, but you lose your balance, and you would fall down, and you would look foolish. And so in street ball, that's what everybody wanted to make you do. And this, this, this title, the sham god, is actually the title of a basketball, street ball basketball move. And I'm going to put his, uh, put his picture up here on the far right of the screen. You see this gentleman on the far right of the screen? This is his, his name, his nickname. All street ballers had nicknames. His nickname was God Sham God. Okay? Now, the reason why he was called this nickname is because he was one of the grandfathers of street ball in general. Like, street ball was like a thing because of this guy in a lot of ways. So his nickname was God Sham God. But he created a move that became world-renowned, famous amongst all basketball players, and they use it in the NBA, the National, National Basketball Association, to this day. I use it all the time when I play basketball, even on pickup games with some of my friends or the AFCO students or whatever. And it's, the move is called the Sham God. And how it works, let's say I have someone guarding me here. I'm not going to ask someone to come guard me. I did that the other day for Amazing Facts staff, and nobody took me up on it. So. But let's say I had somebody guarding me. And imagine the goal is right here in front of me. I'm wanting to get around my defender. The sham god move is to make them think you're going left, but then you pull the ball back to the right. Did you see that? So notice, you make them think you're going left, but really you're going to the right. So that's called the sham god. You throw it out one direction, and you pull it back the other direction, and you can go, and if you're quick, I was always quick as a kid, so it worked in my advantage. You could easily beat your defender, get a foot past them, and you could get a layup, open layup, right to the basket. So it's called the sham god. Now. Enough of the basketball trickery. <laughs> this move was, de was designed to deceive your opponent. The purpose of me bringing this up here and showing you guys this is because the devil, 
is going to be giving God's people, the church, a sham God in these last days. He's going to be trying to make us think he's doing one thing. Are you following? But in reality, he's doing another thing. He's going in a completely different direction. So as we get into this message, keep in mind, the whole purpose of Satan's personation of Christ is to deceive. Who? Does he already have the worldlings right where he wants them? Does he already have everybody else right where he wants them? Yes. Who is the devil trying to deceive, saints? Someone tell me. He's trying to deceive God's people, is he not? He's trying to deceive those who are following the Bible, who want to follow God and who want to you know, serve Him. He's trying to deceive the faithful in the last days. And we as the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we know God has put a special mission, a special mission statement even behind our, our church, that we are to take the three angels' messages to how much of the world? All of the world, beloved. We cannot, we cannot think that in, as these last days are growing, you know, as we're going closer and closer to the end of time, that Satan's just going to, you know, he's going to just lose power and lose might. No, he's going to increase his attempts to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Are you with me? And we have to be careful that we do not fall into his sham God. Don't fall for it. You know, in basketball, when you're playing basketball, the how you know what a person is about to do is you've got to know the footwork. You've got to know what they're about to set you up for. You have to pay attention to the footwork. And as we look at the footwork of the devil and at his plans and at his deceptions this morning, we will see that he's planning to go one direction and we're not going to fall for it. Are you with me? We're going to be able to, we're going to, be able to continue our defensive stance, if you will, so that we will not be swooned or, or duped or deceived by Satan's dubious, deceptive practices in these last days. We don't want to be falling down and looking foolish in the last days. Who says amen? amen. You don't want your ankles broken in the last days. Amen? amen? So we got to be careful as we move forward. Now, let me ask this question. What does the evangelical churches today believe will happen when Christ comes back? Who knows? Who knows? John, go ahead. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's part of it, yes. But what do they believe, notice, will happen when Christ comes back Specifically, if you, if you studied with a lot of the evangelicals, I grew up in the evangelical world, studied with most of them, there's a specific thing they believe. Jacob, go ahead. Ah, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. How many of you have heard this before? Our brothers and sisters in Christ that we love dearly, they, they go around and they preach and they teach, and they've been doing this, guys, for like over 100 years now. They've been going around and telling everybody that when, when Jesus Christ comes back, we can't wait. He's going to be setting up shop in Jerusalem. He's going to come through the streets of Jerusalem. And he's going to be able to be here with us. And he's going to set up his kingdom. Jerusalem's going to be supreme again. You know, God, God, Israel's going to be supreme again. And right there, Jesus is going to reign on this earth for a thousand years. Because they interpret the thousand year reign to be where? Here on earth, not in heaven. Are you following? Why do you think... Now, right, let me ask you. Who do you think deceived them into believing that? Satan. We know it's not in the Bible. We know that that idea is totally divorced of the revelation given to us in the Word of God. We see it so clearly in the book of Revelation. But the problem is, he's got everyone believing that for a reason. Because he is actually planning to personate Christ in these last days. And notice I didn't say impersonate. Did you catch that? A lot of people when they talk about this subject, they'll say, well, Satan's planning to impersonate Christ. Well, keep in mind, an impersonation is when someone you know, like let's say I'm trying to impersonate Christopher Walken. Anybody know who Christopher Walken is? Famous actor, Denzel Washington, maybe you guys heard of him. If I was trying to impersonate one of these guys, you would, you would know it's not Denzel Washington because who are you looking at? You're looking at Dakota Day, right? You would know that when I say, well, you know... Happy Sabbath this morning to all of you. You know I'm not Christopher Walken. Are you following? And if I tried to pull off a Denzel and I said, all right, okay, 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 all right. Yeah, you want to go to church this Sabbath? Okay, all right. You're immediately going to know, okay, well, that, I, that's not Denzel because you can look at me and tell, first of all, I'm not black. Amen? <laughs> Second, I'm not near as handsome as that brother. And I don't have the swagger of that brother. Are you with me? Immediately you can tell I'm not no Denzel Washington. So that's impersonation. 
but a personation of someone is when somebody is deceptively and fraudulently trying to basically make you think they are that person. That's what Satan is trying to do in these last days. He is going to personify Christ and make the world think that he literally is Christ, but he is not such. And the only way we're not going to be deceived by Satan's personification of Christ is if we take heed to the admonition that Jesus has given us throughout the Bible of the warnings of these false Christs that will come. Who says amen? Amen. amen. Now, open your, open your Bibles with me. And if you, you don't have to, if you don't have a Bible, the scriptures will all be on the screen today because we're going to be going through a lot of material. So all of this will be on the screen today. But I want to uh, encourage you to open your Bible just so that you can see it from your Bible as well. Revelation chapter 16, we're going to look at verse 13. Notice what the Word of God says here. And I saw three unclean spirits like what? Frogs come out of the mouth of the who? Dragon. Let's stop for a moment. Now someone tell me, saints tell me, who is the dragon represent in Bible prophecy? Satan. Satan. How do we prove that? How do we know that? Everything we believe should be proven from where? The Bible. How do we prove that? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 and Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2 tells us that the dragon is the devil and Satan. Can somebody say amen? amen. All right, we see that. Revelation 12, 9, Revelation 20 and 2. So notice, I saw three unclean spirits like what? Frogs. Now notice, how does a frog catch its prey? With its tongue. So these, these three unclean spirits, beloved, listen, they have messages. They have what? Messages. messages. Now, in these last days, we have... God's people in the last days has also three messages. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Don't let me get all excited by myself. <laughs> we have three messages that's going to, supposed to go to how much of the world? Oh. All of the world. What do we call these messages? Three. The three angels' messages that's going to all of the world. Notice, historically, our church, and rightfully so, biblically so, has taught that these three unclean spirits, like frogs, a frog catches its prey with its mouth, these three unclean spirits, these messages that's coming out of the mouth, notice, out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast. Who's the beast of Revelation? The papacy, that is correct. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. Who's the false prophet? Apostate Protestantism. Those that are not following the Bible. Those that are not literally following God's word as God has given it for us. And so they're prophesying false things, right? Notice. These three unclean spirits are the counterfeit to the three angels' message. Can we say amen? amen? They are the counterfeit to the three angels' messages. Now notice what it goes on to say here about these, these three unclean spirits. By the way, by the way, notice, I, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I'm going to go slow today for everybody. Am I going too fast so far? Everybody following, picking up what I'm laying down, smelling what I'm cooking? All right, good. Notice. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of three different parties. The dragon, the beast, and the who? The false prophet. So here's the threefold union that's going to come together to form a counterfeit to God's three angels' messages that we see in Revelation chapter 14. That's the everlasting gospel that's going to reach the whole world. Now, we talk an awful lot in our church about the beast, do we not? We talk about the message of the beast and the doctrines of the beast and everything that's written by the beast and all of the, you know, doctrines that they promulgate. But do we talk also a lot about the false prophet? We do. We talk about apostate Protestant churches, do we not? Do we talk about all the false churches out there that are preaching doctrines that are not found in the Word of God? Preaching and teaching things that are not biblical. Yes, we talk an awful lot about that. We expose those deceptions, do we not? Is those messages being preached today? Yes or no? Yes. Is the false prophet preaching today? Does he have a message for the world? Yeah. Does the beast of Revelation, the papacy themselves, do they have a message for the world? You better believe it. Now, notice how we never talk about the first one, the dragon himself. You guys ever noticed this before? We don't spend enough time talking about Notice, these are three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the who? The dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Revelation 12, 9 tells us it's that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So Satan, according to this prophecy, will also 
preach a message for all of the world to hear in the last days. Are you hearing me? It says it's coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Not out of the mouth of the beast. The beast has his own message. Not out of the mouth of the false prophet. The false prophet has his own message. And both the false prophet and the beast got their message from who? The dragon. But keep in mind, it says the dragon's going to have something coming out of his mouth. We know who the dragon is. It's Satan. Are you following? All right. So, according to the Bible, there will come a time when the dragon himself will give a message to the world. And I want to submit to you that that will take place when Satan personifies Christ. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. But Dakota, you've got to have to prove this from the Bible because I've never heard this before. Oh, just wait. Just wait. We're going to get there. Just, just hold on. Hold on. Now, let's keep reading on to verse 14. And then notice, notice how this is going to happen, by the way. It goes on to say, For they, speaking of these three unclean spirits, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophets. For they are the spirits of what? Devils working what? Miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth. Is that the leaders of the world? You better believe it. They're going forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So in other words, Satan is trying to build up an army. But in order to build up an army, the army that he's trying to build up has to agree with him. Are you following? Hence why there is a message that precedes the miracles. Are we together, saints? So these miracles are going to be worked as these messages are being preached. And so, oh, my friends, we need to be careful. Now, let me, let me ask you to, to participate with me. Now, some of you may not be familiar with the lingo that I'm using this morning. That's okay. If you misunderstand anything or if you, if you have questions about anything, please come to me afterwards. I'll be glad to, to try to answer your questions and explain these things to you. How many of you believe that this scripture here, this passage in Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, takes place after the close of probation? Raise your hands if you believe this takes place after the close of probation. No one's raising their hands. Okay, all right. There's a lot of people in our church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, that teach that this passage takes place after the close of probation. Now, do you know why they believe this? Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to give you some background. Now, how many of you have heard of the seven last plagues of Revelation? Right? Right? The first plague is these noisome and grievous sores that are falling upon the men and women who have received the what? The mark of the beast. The second plague, who knows? It's the seas are being turned into what? Blood. The third plague, what's connected to the seas? The rivers. The rivers are then turned to blood. God is basically giving back the, the judgment. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you meet, it will be measured back to you. So the persecution that they have done against God's people in the last days, God just gives them their own judgment back upon them. But this judgment is big. It's called the wrath of God. And it's only according to Revelation 16, at the very beginning of Revelation 16, it's only poured out upon the men and women who have received the what? The mark of the beast. So, we understand in Bible prophecy that when the first plague hits, that's the sign that what has closed? Probation has closed. In other words, meaning the judgments of God are completed. They're final. And now the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the wicked. Then you have the seven last plagues, and then you have the second coming of Jesus. Are you following me? Okay, so, so notice in Revelation chapter 16 something very important. The reason why so many people in our church believe that this takes place before the close of probation, I'm sorry, after the close of probation, is because of this. Revelation chapter 16, and let's pick it up in verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse uh, 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Now remember, the fourth plague was what? God scorched men with what? Fire, with the sun, right? He scorched them with fire from the sun. So the sun already, I mean, is shining bright as it is, right? Can you imagine what this plague is going to feel like? It'd be like for those wicked people who have rejected the seal of God and accepted the mark of the beast. Then the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the river Euphrates, and, and it says here, And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. 
Everyone, notice, we stopped it. We read verses 13 and 14. Now we're on verse 13. What precedes these three unclean spirits? It's the plagues. But I want to submit to you something that most people are not seeing. I'm going to back up here on the screen just so you can see the next scripture here. Notice, verse 13 says, And I saw. Did you catch that? He's already explaining what happens with the plagues. Boom, 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 boom. But now there's an interruption. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Understand, there's an interruption. He's going through the plagues. Everybody, a lot of people in our church, they think, oh, that means that these three unclean spirits and this, this you know, miracles that's going to be worked is going to take place after the close of probation, so we don't need to worry about that. Are you with me? But I want to submit to you that this in Revelation 16 is not a continuation into the plagues. It's not like John is saying, this is, this is all happening chronologically here. He's switching visions. Are you following this? He says, and I saw. And then he begins to describe what? These three unclean spirits. Now, historically, our church has always taught that these three unclean spirits are the counterfeit to the three angels' messages. But let me ask you a question. Let me back up and ask you a question. Is the beast preaching his message now? Yeah. Yes. Is the, is the false prophet, apostate Protestantism, are they preaching their messages now? Yes. Before This is before probation is closed. Probation hasn't closed yet. Can we say amen? amen. We still have, everyone right now has an opportunity to accept Christ. Amen. So what makes us think the dragon's going to wait? Amen? What makes us think the dragon is going to be like, okay, you go ahead, beast. And okay, you go ahead, false prophet. You do your preaching, buddy. And I'm going to wait until it's too late to show up and preach my message. Now, now, a lot of people, when they say they first studied this, they say, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But you know why people change their views on this? You know why people change their views and they think, oh no, it's after the close of probation, not before. It's because their favorite ministers share an opinion. And they might present an opinion and present a, a way of looking at something. Are you with me? And they very well may be completely, genuinely sincere about sharing what they share. Are we together? Remember, you can be sincere, but be sincerely what? Wrong. Amen? And they say, oh, but this brother... He's a very renowned and respected pastor. And surely he knows better than me. And, and so because he's with that ministry and that ministry pretty much gets everything else right, I'm going to go with what that minister says and, and I'm only going to study what they preach and what they present instead of studying it for myself. Are you following me? This is why our churches get split on some... some I mean, this is a thing that you gotta, you just got to keep in mind. This is a subject that could potentially affect your salvation. You understand this. Anytime we're talking about deception, don't get so heady and high-minded to think, oh, no, I know the Bible. I can't be deceived. Watch out. Because that's exactly how deceived people think. You don't see someone walking around saying, hi, I'm deceived and I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. People think they know what they're talking about. And that's just what makes it so cunning. You see, the essence of deception is that you are unaware that you are or have been deceived, beloved. You don't know you're deceived. That's what's called deception. You think you know the truth, but in reality, you've been duped. You've been drinking back on Grandma's old cough medicine. Drinking the wine of Babylon. And you're setting yourself up for deception. We've got to be careful. Who says amen? amen. So the devil's not going to wait around. And show up after the beast has preached his message and after the false prophets preach his message. No, this is the counterfeit to the three angels' messages. Is everyone understanding me so far this morning? Amen. This is the counterfeit to the three angels' messages. So, the reason why everybody believes that that's talking about after the close of probation is because it comes within the chapter that the plagues fall. But can we point to other passages of Scripture that's not chronologically supposed to be understood chronologically? Can we go to other passages of Scripture like Daniel 8 and 9 and say this ain't necessarily chronological here? Amen? 
We can go to other passages of Scripture and say, oh, no, 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 this is here, this is here. And then, he, and then Daniel sees this vision, and then the word for vision changes, and it's a different vision. And then we start realizing, oh, we got to put, we got to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Who says amen? amen? Same thing with this. So he switches scenes here, and he says, and I saw. And then he starts warning them about, notice, these spirits of devils working what? Miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Guys, listen. If probation's already closed, the kings of the earth don't need any more convincing. Can somebody say amen to that? If probation's already closed, the kings of the earth, the whole world don't need any more convincing because they've already accepted the mark of the beast. Everyone with me? All right, all right. So... How do we prove from the Bible that Satan will personate Christ? Who wants to know that? You say, man, I want to know that. Show that to me from the Bible. Because when we talk about Satan's personification of Christ, what always happens is we go straight to the last day prophet. We go straight to Sister Ellen White's writings, and we read prophetically what God showed her in vision. Now, guys, listen. Let me just correct our church on something in case you got it all backwards. The spirit of prophecy does not prove the Bible. Can somebody say hallelujah and amen? amen? We got it back. We're trying to use the spirit of prophecy first to prove and, and promulgate our point when we should be studying it first and saying, okay, Ellen White says that. Where do I find that in the Bible? This is what I got to do. I got to study to show ourselves approved. We should be going to the Bible first. And who says Amen. Oh, man, this is, this is so important, and this is a, a mistake many of us make. We're going to look at some prophecies from Ellen White's writings this morning, but we're going to see how those prophecies line up with the what? With the Bible, with the prophecies of the Bible. Amen? So we need to prove how Satan will personate Christ from the Bible first. Now, are you guys ready? I don't believe you. I'm going to sit down until you're ready. I'm just getting more, let's get more people ready. Hey, it's Sabbath. I got all day. I ain't got nowhere else to be. You guys ready? Yes. yes. There we go. I like some enthusiasm, man. Praise God for some enthusiasm. If we believe this message, we should act like we believe it. That's right. We should be excited about what God has shown us in his word so that we will not be led astray and we can help others to not be led astray. God's given us such a precious message. Let's act like it. How do we prove from the Bible that Satan will personate Christ? In Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, notice what the word of God says. How art thou fallen from heaven, O who? Lucifer. This was Satan's name before he fell. Are you with me? Satan's name before he fell was Lucifer. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now, notice he's reminding us of the past. How are you what? Fallen from heaven, O, 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 o Lucifer. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? So according to this passage, has Satan already failed? Yes, do this right here. Let me help you out. Yes, yes. Satan has already fell, fallen. Now, now he's talked about the past. Satan has already fallen. He's already been booted out of heaven. So now notice what he goes on to say. We oftentimes read this scripture as a prophecy of the past. So when we teach our evangelistic meetings, even I myself have been guilty of it. We say, oh, well, well Satan, what happened here is that he, you know, he, he wanted to be God. And he wanted to sit on the throne, and that's why he was kicked out of heaven. And yes, 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 that is all true. Amen. But notice what God says. For thou hast said in thine heart. Now keep in mind, Satan is not showing us his cards here. Satan isn't talking here. Who's doing the talking? God is talking to his church. And God tells his church, for Satan has said where? In his heart. And now he quotes Satan. God is quoting. God knows the heart, doesn't he? And he's warning God's last day people about Satan's plan that he will attempt in the future. Notice. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into where? Heaven. heaven. Notice. If he's already in heaven, then what does it make sense for him to ascend into heaven? Doesn't make any sense. I will what? Ascend into heaven. I will, did you catch that, that language? I will, he hasn't done any of this yet. He's going to. I will ascend into heaven. 
By the way, where's Jesus Christ coming back from? The heavens. I will, notice, exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, someone tell me, in Bible prophecy, what's the stars of God a symbol of? It's the angels of God. How do we know that? How do we prove that? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 tells us that the stars represent the angels of God. Are we together? Satan wanted to have worship. He wanted everybody to pay homage to him. He didn't want people looking at God. He was thinking the whole time while he was in heaven, man, like, why can't I be worshipped? And this is exactly why he was booted out. But then God reveals what's going on in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. By the way, what did Jesus Christ tell us in Revelation chapter 3 to the message of the Laodiceans? What did he say? To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And what did he tell Caiaphas and them in the inner court? He said, remember the, remember the uh, Sanhedrin when Jesus was taken in? Remember that? He was arrested. He was taken in. What did he tell them? Are, they said, are you the son of God? And he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you will see me coming in the clouds of heaven and sitting on the right hand of power. Amen. Bro, that's a prophecy. Amen? That's a prophecy. So notice, God is indicating in the word that he's coming back with like a throne. Are you hearing me? Wherever God is, is really where the throne is. Can somebody say amen? amen? So notice, Satan is saying the same thing. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be above all of the other angels of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Keep in mind, Jesus Christ tells us in Scripture, He's coming back with His angels. All of heaven will be emptied at the second coming of Jesus. How many angels did Satan deceive in Revelation? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon's tail drew one-third of the stars of God. Who's the stars of God? Revelation 120 is the angels of God, His tail. Remember, the devil told a lie. What do we call a lie? A tail. Amen? His tail drew one-third of the stars of God. And so he deceives them, and then he says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit. So he's saying, I'm going to be coming back. I'm going to be in the heavens with some stars. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the what? Of the north. Don't forget that passage. In the sides of the what? North. Someone's wanting to be a king from the north. Are you with me? I will. All of this is prophecy. All of this is foretold by who? God, so it's not a lie. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Where's Jesus Christ coming back from? The clouds. I will be like the Most High. Am I making this up or are we seeing this from the Bible saints? Has any of that happened yet? Who's telling us this? God is telling us this. He's telling us the heart of Lucifer, what he will do in his heart. What he's thinking in his heart already to do is to personate Christ, to personate God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, how do we know this is a prophecy of the future? To even give it more solidification? God says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the what? Of the pit. When does that happen for Satan? When Jesus Christ comes back, remember, he takes his saints to heaven with him. Amen? All of the dead in Christ are raised out of the graves. We all that are alive and remain, caught up with our loved ones, we meet Jesus in the air. Hallelujah! We go to be with heaven, uh, go, to, go to heaven with Jesus to be with him for a thousand years where we look over the works of judgment according to prophecies. And what happens? Satan is bound on earth for a thousand years. The Bible says that mountains disappear because of the great earthquake of the seventh plague. It, it, it literally, the world itself is quite literally a bottomless pit or an abyss. Are you following me? God says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This is a prophecy of the future, guys. Are you following? All right. Now, is Satan's personation of Christ on the final test or not? That's the question. That's the question we need to be aware of. 
Because you've got some people in our church that are saying, oh, well, probation's going to close, and then Satan's going to personify Christ. Now, I know why they believe that, and I know they're sincere in sharing that, but here's what happens to a lot of us Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We think, oh, well, I mean, I'm not going to be deceived by that thing because probation's already going to be closed, and I'm going to be fine. I'm not even... You know what that's like to us? That's like the rapture theory. Remember our brothers and sisters in the evangelical world, they believe in the secret silent what? Rapture. And remember, they are told that they don't have to study the book of Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 22. Why? Because the word church isn't mentioned. And therefore, God's people from chapter 3 and onward is going to be raptured out of here secretly and silently. And only those that are left behind for seven horrible years of tribulation are going to you know, have to endure this, tribu- this seven years of tribulation. Are you with me? Of course, none of that is biblical. But this is my point. Christians outside of our church today, many that which are genuine, who really want to follow God, but they've just been deceived. Are you following me? Many of them love the Lord. Me and my family used to be some of them. They love the Lord. They're trying to do what's right, but they're just being deceived. They think, well, I don't have to really get right with Jesus now, you know, because I'll get a second chance in the seven years of tribulation. Are you with me? And so their idea is that if all of that's the case... I'll be raptured out of here too. So if I'm living in connection with Jesus, I'm going to be raptured out of here. Praise God. I won't have to see any tribulation. And I'm going to be right on up into heaven. But then the Seventh-day Adventists think the same way when we think to ourselves, oh, you know, we're, we're not going to have to worry about Satan's personation of Christ and all that stuff because, you know, we're already going to be sealed and probation's already going to be closed and, and we're going to be fine and dandy. Ah, my friends, be careful. Be very, very careful. Because while I want to submit to you that is, yes, a knowledge of God's Word is significant to understand. Amen? Amen. We need to know the Word of God. Let me remind you of a story that you may have forgotten. In the Garden of Eden, did Eve know the Word of God? Did she know that God said, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely what? Die. Did she know that? She quoted it to Lucifer. She quoted it to the serpent. But then what happened? She engaged with Lucifer. She engaged with the serpent. And in his, and in his great grand deception, he was able to dupe and deceive her into thinking that, you know, really, God's withholding something good from you here. And he was able to get her to do what God told her not to do. So then she ends up putting more faith, are you ready for this, in her experience with Satan than she did in the Word of God. So was her knowledge of the Word of God enough to save her? No. You see, we have to obey the Word of God too. But we in our church, sometimes we get so heady and high-minded and we think, oh, oh, I, I know the Word of God. I know it backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards and I know how to prove every doctrine and prove every belief and show somebody and give somebody a Bible study. Praise God, I know it. I won't be deceived. And you might be so cocky that when somebody tells you, this ain't, this is Jesus, man. He's in Jerusalem right now, I'm telling you. And he's going to appear over here next. He said he's coming over here to the USA next. Are you with me? And you say, oh, oh, really? Well, I'll show you that it's not him. I'll talk to this dude. No. I'll, show, I'll, show, I'll, I'll see how well he knows the Bible. I'm going to set him straight with my doctrinal Seventh-day Adventist teaching. What did Jesus say? For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, remember Jesus said, following after this, go with me to Matthew 24 real quick. Go with me to Matthew 24 real quick. Matthew chapter 24. He said following this, the following words. Notice. verse 25. So following this verse that we just read, verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go give them a debate. Is that what he said? Go prove them wrong for my word. Go preach the gospel to them. No, no, no. What did he say? 
go not forth. Behold, he is in the de- secret chambers. What did he say? Believe it not. Guys, listen. The reason why Jesus is saying don't go, because if you do go, those signs and those wonders, you and I have not seen the way they are coming. We have not seen Satan eyeball to eyeball, face to face, much less to him exercise the power of which God allows him to have to literally personify Christ in the last days, to be like the Most High in the last days. We have not seen that kind of power. We have not seen that kind of glory. We have not beheld it with our eyeballs yet, but it's coming. And if you think, oh, I'm so good, I got this down, boy. I'm going to set them straight. Watch out. Now, a lot of Christians in our church, they say, well, Dakota, what you're missing here is that it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. Now, everybody debates about this scripture, and everybody argues about this scripture, but I'm going to set the record straight this morning. Who says amen? amen? Notice. And by the way, I tell everybody in all my prophecy meetings that I do full time, don't trust me. Trust the Bible. Don't put your trust in me. Don't say, oh, Brother Day said it. I believe Brother Day. He's enthusiastic and on fire for the Lord and loves Jesus. And, I, and if he, I, I don't believe he'll lead me astray. No, no, no. Listen, I don't even trust me. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Don't trust me. I don't even trust me. I studied six and a half hours this message yesterday before I came here to preach it. Amen. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Got up early this morning and spent a whole other hour and a half looking over everything. Saying, God, lead me. Help me. Preach your word. Preach the truth. So everyone, when they read this scripture, they say, Oh, but see, Dakota, what you're missing is that it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. If you read this scripture the way it reads right here, then it appears, yes, that it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. Notice, notice. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets that shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, makes it sound like it's not possible. But hold on a second, beloved. See that underlined words there, those two underlined words? And I got them in italics there. What is those words? It were. It were. Now, in your Bible, in every Bible, if the words are in italics, what does that mean? It was added by the translators, which means it wasn't in the original Greek and Hebrew, which means it could change the meaning of the entire text. So now, in your, in your mind... If you didn't know that, now you know. I want you just to omit that it were out because it's not in the original Greek and Hebrew. Or it's not in the original Greek here. Let's read it without the it were and see how, how it turns out. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, Christ said, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Is it possible for the elect to be deceived? You better believe it. Got a question for you. Was David, the little shepherd boy, was he God's elect? Did God show, choose David? You better believe it, my friends. He chose David from a little shepherd boy, raised him up. He was smacking lions and smacking bears on the heads with his rod, knocking them smooth out. Are you with me? He had the power of God, anointed with the power of God. And when he saw Goliath stepping out there, popping off at the mouth, you know, he walks out there to those... To the, to the Israelites, and he goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he, he's popping off the mouth about our God? He says, what are you guys doing shaking in your boots over here? He says, I'll go take him on. Are you with me? And David goes out there, grabs five smooth stones. You say, man, David wasn't a man of faith. No, he was. He heard that Goliath had four other brothers. He was ready for them too. Slings one stone right there. Pow! He changed Goliath's frontal lobe. Amen? Instead of the beast changing his mind, he changed the beast mind. David was chosen, elect, precious in God's sight. David was, David was the only man in the Bible militarily that never lost a war, never lost a battle. Boom, a man after God's own heart. Except for one battle. Militarily, he never lost a battle. But when he should have been with his men at war, amen? amen, every leader should be with his soldiers. He was back home. Ah, man, look at my kingdom. I'm so excited about my kingdom. 
Praise God. He was probably singing hymns. He probably had a, a, a young man over there on the, on the harp while he was dancing it up. Are you with me? He was excited. He was like, man, praise God. Look at what all God has brought me. And in complete innocence, David walks out one day and just enjoying the view. Are you with me? And he sees Bathsheba bathing. Perfect name for her, Bathsheba. There she is. She's bathing and she probably knew or didn't know. I don't know her, 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 what was going on in her heart or if she knew anybody could see, but David had a clear view. And he should have did this militarily. I need to go back in. I don't need to be looking at that. I already got a wife. Couple. God was patient with David. He had other issues. But what happened? He just couldn't get that image out of his mind. And instead of, instead of saying no to his flesh, he lost a spiritual battle, didn't he? See, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Can somebody say amen? amen. And what happened? David fell into sin, and then he tried covering it up. He tried calling Uriah to come back. Hey, Uriah, man. Hey, bro, come on. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's have some good drinks, man. And hey, why don't you just go be home with your wife tonight? Because he done got her knocked up. He's trying to cover it up. Uriah been at war all those times. This was God's elect. Don't tell me the elect can't be deceived. Check your Bibles. Amen? Amen. Moving forward. Uh, yes, moving forward. So, no, notice. He will show great signs and wonders in so much that if possible, they shall deceive the very elect. This is why he says in the following verses, don't go. Nobody's going to have to come ring your doorbell, calling your cell phone saying, ding dong, Jesus is here. Amen. Amen? Amen? The whole world unanimously is going to know at the same time that Jesus has arrived. But you know why Satan has been deceiving everybody again? About believing that he's gonna, when Christ comes, he's going to set up shop here on earth for a thousand years. The devil is not omnipresent. What is omnipresent? I mean, he can't be everywhere at the same time. He don't have that power. He don't have that glory. He don't have that kind of might. So he has to arrive at different parts of the earth to deceive Christ, to, to, to personate Christ. He has to show up at different parts of the world. And he has to try to deceive people by his signs and wonders and miracles that they might believe he actually is the real Christ. This is why Jesus said, if you go, you just might be deceived. Amen? Notice this quote. This is from Second Selected Messages, page 58. Rebellion and apostasy are in the very air we breathe. We shall be affected by it unless by faith, uh, we, unless by faith we hang our helpless souls upon Christ. That was a typo there, my, my, my bad. If men are so easily misled, how will they stand when Satan shall personate Christ and work miracles? Are you seeing this? She writing this to people outside our church? They don't care to read her writings. She's writing this to people inside our church. Who will be unmoved by his misrepresentations, professing to be Christ, when it is only Satan assuming the person of Christ and apparently working the works of Christ? What will hold whose people? God's people from giving their allegiance to false Christ. She says, Scripture, go ye not after them. That's what's going to keep you from being deceived. Can you say amen? What is going to unite all the nations together to worship falsely and accept the mark of the beast? Now think about this. Pay, pay close attention to this, to this question. What is going to unite all of the what? All of the nations together to do what? To worship falsely and accept the mark of the beast, which is nation, you know, not national, but universal, universal recognition of Sunday, which is the mark of the papacy, as to be universally observed. Are you with me? If you haven't studied the mark of the beast and you're totally oblivious to what I just said, I understand. Come talk to me afterwards. I'll give you some of my studies. But what is God going, what is going to unite all of the nations together to worship falsely? It's the Pope, right? The Pope's going to do it. The Pope's going to do it, right? It's the Pope. Jorge Mario Bergoglio is going to do it, right? No. No. 
That's Pope Francis, if you didn't know. That's his real name. That one man's going to cause all that to happen, right? Got a question. Does China care about the Pope? When's the last time you've seen the, the president or the prime minister of China over there being like, oh, yes, Pope. Are you with me? Bowing to the doctrinal teachings of Catholicism. Is, is Kim Jong-un from North Korea, does he care about the Pope? No. Does India care about the Pope? Do you realize just in these, those, those nations, Vietnam, do they care about the Pope? Does Russia... Are you seeing this? Listen, guys. What's going to unite everyone together is not one man in a hundred acre spot in Rome. He has power. He has, he has recognition. Don't get me wrong. I preach on this all of the time. Prophetically, the papacy will play a huge role in bringing about the religious world. But India don't care about Catholicism. They're about Hinduism. Are you hearing me? China won't let it come in their nation. You can't even preach Christ in China. You will go to prison for a long time. Are you hearing me? We're on the edge of eternity right now. We're on the like, last final scenes of Bible prophecy. And, and yet, we think the Pope's going to do it all? No. Mm-mm. I know what's going to unite the nations together to worship falsely and to accept the Sunday law and the mark of the beast. It's going to be climate change. <laughs> what's going to happen is that they're going to say, listen, guys, let's all rest the land one day. Will that work for some people? Yes, it's going to work for some people. But do you think China's going to be on board with all of that? Yeah, let's, let's honor Sunday as the Lord's Day now. That'll be real nice. India is going to be all on board with that. Vietnam's going to be on board with that. North Korea's going to be on board with that. Russia's going to be on board with that. Give me a break, guys. We're in 2023, and none of them are on board with it yet. Indonesia, not on board with it yet. I mean, I could just keep going on. But I'm naming highly populated countries. How many people does, does China have? Over a billion people in China alone. That's one-seventh of the Earth's population. We think the Pope's going to do it and climate change is going to do it. Hadn't done it yet. Hadn't even got close. What do you think is going to unite all the world together to worship falsely? See, the religious world, the Pope's got that on lockdown. He's got that on lockdown. All the churches, all of the leaders of all the churches, they go over there and they have their private meetings with the Pope. And they, you know, they have their little powwow there in Vatican City. They exchange gifts and then they you know, kiss each other's hands, bow down to the Pope, and then they go back home. He's got that on lockdown. The beast is preaching his message. But it's not the beast message alone that will bring about the deceptions of the last days. And it's not apostate Protestantism's message alone. That will gather and collect together the religious world. But the unbelieving, unreligious world is not going to be united by some pope or some climate change. We just had a pandemic in 2020. Now, whether you have personal views about that or not, doesn't matter to me. I don't, I don't care about that. We're not here to talk about politics. Amen? I don't care if you're a Republican this morning or a Democrat or if you're a Demublican or a Republican. Makes me no difference. But what I do say this morning is that we had a pandemic that affected the whole world, didn't it? Did we all come together in agreement? It's like, yes, we all need to take the vaccine. No. No. I have a lot of Facebook friends that were all like, whoo, uh-uh. You know what? I was one of them. I didn't want that. That's my personal opinion. Are you with me? I respect your opinion, you respect my opinion. That's not in the Bible. Are you following me? What is in the Bible, what's going to bring about the last days, my friends, listen to me, what's going to bring about the last days is not some pandemic. A pandemic could unite the world. A pandemic could unite all the nations to agree on something because you had all these people over there teaching all kinds of stuff. You had hundreds and millions of Christians saying that the vaccine was the mark of the beast. Are you hearing me? First, it was the barcode. They got that wrong. They moved on to the credit cards. They got that wrong. Then they moved on. Are you hearing me? Then they moved on the computer chip. Now they're realizing maybe that ain't it either. That's the vaccine. Are you hearing me? They've been changing their opinions like girl changes clothes. So the point here is we 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 got to be straight as a gun barrel theologically and just as filled as one spiritually. Amen? 
We've got to preach the truth. So what do you think is going to unite all the world together? Go with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Now, I'm going to tell you in the forefront of this, I don't have everything in the Bible figured out. I'm not attempting up here to try to preach that everything that I've studied is 100% you know, dead on, that I haven't made any mistakes. That's why I tell people, don't trust me. Study for yourselves. Don't say, oh, Dakota Day preached it. I believe it 100%. No, study for yourselves. Who says amen? amen. Don't trust me, beloved. But let's look at Daniel chapter 11. Our church is still trying to understand Daniel chapter 11. Every other chapter of Daniel, we got that on lockdown. We know Daniel chapter 12, we know Daniel chapter 10, we know Daniel chapter 9 and 8 and 7 and 6 and 5 and 4 and 3 and 2 and 1, backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards. When we get to Daniel 11, uh, we have people at the Amazing Fact Center of Evangelism, big ministers in our church, big names in our church, highly renowned, education a lot more deeper and in-depth than mine. Are you with me? And yet, when they get to Daniel 11, when they teach Daniel... They was preaching everything else. Boy, everybody's on fire in the classroom. And then when they get to Daniel chapter 11, you know what they do? They get out a commentary and they just read the whole time. Because they really don't know. Are you following me? Let, let's, let's do what we should always do when we're studying the Bible. Let the Bible interpret itself. When we get to certain parts of Revelation, we start telling people, Oh, 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 well this represents this. Because this represents that, and this represents that. And you say, okay, where is that in the Bible? And we start telling people sometimes what things represent without actually proving it. We as a people should not be doing that. If we're going to study something, we need to let the Bible interpret itself. So Daniel chapter 11, we're going to read verses 40 through 45. These are, these are the passages that I want to submit to you I've studied very significantly. This is leading up to the final events of Bible prophecy, right? What happens in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1? Who knows? Close of probation. So in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, go read that. It says, Michael stands up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. When you do a study on that in prophecy, that means judgment is final. When, when, when Michael stands up, judgment's final, and the military force of God is about to be given to the world. Are you with me? That's the judgments of God. So, so understand this. What happens right before Daniel chapter 12, we need to understand God's. Okay, so verse 40. And at the time of the end, by the way, let me, let me back up here. Let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Daniel chapter 11 is all about the king of the north versus the king of the what? The king of the south. Now let me explain to you historically what our church has taught on this for a very long time. Now there are other views of Daniel 11. There's about three different major interpretations in our church on Daniel 11. We don't have it all figured out, but I'm about to give you one of the interpretations. Are you following me? Okay. This is the one that I believe to be the most convincing based on the studies that I personally have done. But in Daniel chapter 11, we teach that the king of the north represents the papacy or religion, a religious movement that is what? Conservative, in a sense. Are you following me? Historically, this has always been the case. Then the king of the south in Daniel 11 represents atheism or non-believers. Do you see this theme go on even in history? Yes. How many of you remember the French Revolution? I know you didn't live back then on it. That's not what I'm saying. But you studied it, right? You remember going to school and studying the French Revolution. What was the French Revolution all about? It was about what? It was about atheism, right? That France and everything that was happening during the French Revolution, they were so sick of the papacy. That's what it was about. Because the papacy was trying to push their views, their super conservative, hard views on everyone that believed, you know, try to get them to believe uh, like them. And they did this during the Dark Ages. They forced everyone. Everyone that didn't believe like the papacy was killed and, you know, their heads put on poles, put in all kinds of, you know, torturing objects. What happened through the Spanish Inquisition, that was from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., okay? But France comes along and they, had, they, they were tired of it. This is the birth of atheism, and you start seeing this clash of this king of the south and this king of the north. This believers versus non-believers, you could say it this way, so that we all just fit the culture of today. Conservatism versus liberalism. Are you with me? This, was the, this is the ideology of the whole idea, right? Christians are more like conservatives in most parts. They have morals. They have values. Liberals, by, by, by most cultural understandings, they're more immoral in the sense that 
They don't have a moral code. They'll tell you, listen, there's nothing wrong with me being a girl when I'm really a boy. Are you following me? Right? They'll tell you, like, that's not immoral to them. That's not a lie to them. That's who they really are. This is real issues that's going on now in our world. How many of you have been seeing this going on? How many of you feel like we're in, like, a South versus North situation right now in this country? Do you know that most of the, uh, of the people that's even in politics right now, they're concerned that we might be on the brink of a civil war coming up? Are you hearing this? This is what we're seeing all through Daniel 11. This king of the north versus king of the south. And the king of the north pushes at the king of the south. And the king of the south pushes against the king of the north. And it's just... It's like a tennis match. <gasps> and then the king of the south... <gasps> it's like watching Venus and Serena against one another. Are you hearing me? So, so this is what's going on the whole time in Daniel 11. But what we're going to look at is Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to look at just a, these last five verses. And I'm not going to be able to cover it all because I've got to speed up. I've got to speed things up here. But notice what it says. And at that time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Who does the king of the south represent? Unreligious, non-believers, like atheistic style uh, representations here. Notice. So the king of the south pushes at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a what? Whirlwind. With chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. Now notice, this is from three directions that this king of the north comes against the king of the south. How many directions? Three. It comes at him from the sea. It comes at him from horses and chariots. That's the land. And it comes at him from the what? From the air, which is the what? The whirlwind. Are you guys hearing me? Pay close attention. Where else do we see this take place in Revelation? Where else do we see a land situation, a sea situation, and something else in the sky? Revelation chapter 13, you have the dragon. Are you with me? The prince of power of the air, as Jesus calls him. Are you following me? And then you have this land beast and the sea beast. Are you following this? So notice what happens. It says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now keep in mind, we know that we're, taught, we're studying prophecy here, so what do you have to do? You have to let the Bible interpret its what? Itself. So you need to ask yourself, what is a whirlwind? We're going to look at this, and it says here, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So this king of the north is overcoming the king of the south with a whirlwind. With a what? Everybody say whirlwind. 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 A whirlwind. And then he's coming at him with ships. That's from the sea. He's coming at him with horsemen and chariots. That's from the land. So you see an onslaught of attacks coming against the king of the south. Okay? And then what happens? He enters into many countries and he overthrows them. Notice verse 41. And he shall also enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be what? Overthrown. Did you guys catch that? So now this king of the north goes into much of these other countries and in the glorious land. By the way, where Satan, where is everyone expecting Satan to return to? Our Christ, the, the apparent Christ that's going to set up shop here for a thousand years. Where is everybody expecting this Christ to come to? The glorious land. Where's the glorious land? That's Jerusalem. Are you following me? That's Israel. That's, that's, what's God, that's, that's the glorious holy land. Notice. Verse 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and over the silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So it looks like things are hopeless, right? He's getting influence. He's taking over whether or not you buy or sell. He's taking over the treasuries. He's taking over everything. Are you following? And then what happens? Verse 44. Praise God for verse 44. But tidings out of the where? East. And out of the where? North shall trouble him. Where's Jesus Christ say he's coming back from? The east. the east. Tidings. These good tidings out of the east starts to trouble this king of the north. And this king of the east, or this, this, this you know, where, where Jesus is referred to as, you know, this, he's coming like, from the, like the lightning shines from, from the east to the west, right? He's coming back. So this king of the east is going to be coming, and he's going to be troubling him. But notice... There's also a message from the north in a sense. Now, where is the three angels' messages? Where's those three angels flying in Revelation 14? They're flying into the heavens, right? 
And they're proclaiming the message all over the world. This is symbolic of the everlasting gospel being preached. How where? All the world. While Satan is doing his, his bidding and he's deceiving people with these miracles, God's people is preaching the word. And they're saying, that's not Jesus. That's Satan. They're telling the world, that's not Jesus. That's Satan. And they're warning the world of what's going on. Now, guys, keep this in mind. In Revelation 13, who gave the papacy their seat, their power, and their great authority? The dragon. And who is the dragon? Satan. Satan is really what he said in Isaiah chapter 14 in his heart. I will sit in the farthest sides of the north. Are you with me? Notice, this king of the south represents what? Atheism, historically. We understand this. Or non-believers. Who birthed and created atheism? Satan. So, what we see happening even now in our country, liberals, are you with me? All these liberals that's being super, they're pushing at the king of the north. They're pushing at the religious conservatives. Are you with me? And then the devil has people in, on, on the side that's, too, that's, they might appear like they're religious. Are you following me? But in reality, they're not following the word of God. And we know this represents ultimately the papacy. And so they're pushing against, and all these believers and all these people that, that have these morals and these views, they're pushing back. Are you following this? And this has created a big problem in our country and all around the world even now, especially though in America. How many of you guys are seeing this going on? You're seeing it's everywhere. And like every day you turn on the news, that's what, we're, that's what everybody's talking about. So, this king of the north pushes against the king of the south, and he overcomes him. So what the Bible's prophesying will happen, whoops, don't know what happened. All right, praise God. Thank you, Lord. I was just about to pray. What the Bible's prophesying will happen is that religion will appear to win in the end. That there's going to be some type of like false revival take place. Are you with me? But in reality, this is a false revival. This is not a real true revival. Now, let me go back to what a whirlwind represents in Bible prophecy. Someone turn in your Bible. And I don't know if we could have a microphone. Do we have a microphone? All right. If you could take the microphone to whoever can get there. To Job chapter 38 verse 1. It says that this king of the north will come against the king of the south like a whirlwind. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Who has that? Raise your hand if you have that. Okay, this sister right here. I see her right here. She can read that. Yes, right there. Thank you. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. All right. Job, or, or jo God answers Job out of the what? Whirlwind. whirlwind. So in the Bible, what are we already seeing that's being used? God uses a whirlwind to communicate to his people. Are you seeing that? He answers Job out of this whirlwind. Now, someone go to Job 40, verse 6. Who has that? All right, I see a brother's hand up right here. Job 40, verse 6. If you could pass the mic down to Brother Keaton there. Job 40, verse 6. Raise your hand high so they can see you guys. Job 40 and verse 6. How many of you enjoying this so far? All right, how many of you ready to go home? You say, Dakota, you need to stop preaching. All right, praise God. I'm glad you're enjoying it, because I'm trying to get through this. Job 40, verse 6. Go ahead, brother. All right, and Job 40, verse 6 says, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind, and said... Oh, same thing. Notice God is answering Job out of a what? Out of a whirlwind. Now, someone go to Isaiah 66 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 66. Raise your hand high if you have it. We have a brother over here that's got it. Isaiah 66 and verse 15. You may have to pass that mic down if you don't mind. Thank you. COVID's not here yet, so... Our COVID's not here right now, so we're good. Isaiah 66, verse 15. Read that for us, brother. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So notice the Lord will come with what? Whirlwind. With as a fire, like a whirlwind. This is speaking of the second coming of Christ. And it's referencing him coming like a what? Whirlwind. How does this king of the north come against the other countries, come against this king of the south, like a whirlwind? Are you guys following? Amen. And so, 
what we're seeing is that this is, this, I believe this is speaking of Satan's personification of Christ. Now, go with me to verse 44. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. We're in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44. And shall go forth, and he shall go forth with great fury to what? Destroy and to utterly make away many. Guys, death decree. Are you, are you hearing this? Death decree will come then upon God's people because this king, of the, this king of the north is going to be upset that God's people, these tidings out of the east and from the north, these three angels' messages are soon to be upon him and he's tired of them preaching these messages so he will send a death decree to destroy them, to take away many. Are you with me? All right. And then notice verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall, be, he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Notice, he shall plant his tabernacle of his palace between the seas. It doesn't mention which seas, but it's interesting. Did you know that Jerusalem is in between two seas? The Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where all of the evangelical world has been preaching, their Messiah is going to come and set up shop. Are you hearing this? So, then what happens in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1? And Michael, notice, notice what it says. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And notice, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. And at that time thy people shall be what? Deliver, praise God, hallelujah, everyone that is found written in the book. So when it's looking helpless for God's people, the death decree goes forward. Michael stands up, and notice what it says here. Which stand for the children of the people. It says, and, and uh, there shall be a time of trouble. That's the seven last plagues that will come up on planet Earth. God says, okay, you're going after my people. I'm only going to give you what you gave them. And he gives them the wrath of God, the seven last plagues. And he, gives them, he says, you want the sun? You want sun day? What does God pour the vial out upon in Revelation 16? The vial is poured out upon the sun, and the sun scorched men with fire. God gives them their Sunday. Are you with me? He only gives them back what they give His people. God is a just God who says amen. amen. Revelation 13, 13. And He doeth great wonders so that He maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Now notice, this is speaking of the second beast in Revelation 13. But who is giving power to all of these beasts? Satan. But I want to submit to you, we look at just the beast here, and we don't think about the power behind the beast. We've got to think of Satan too. He's the one that's puppeteering this act. He's the one puppeteering this whole show. He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those what? Of those miracles which he has power to do in the sight of the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. And then what does he go on to say? It goes on to say, and they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live, and that the whole world would begin to worship the what? The beast, his image, and accept its mark. So notice, this fire comes down from God out of heaven, or comes down out of heaven, rather. But this is not from God, this is from who? This is from Satan. So what does this represent? Well, let's read something for an interesting moment here. Maranatha, page 207. The enemy is prepared to deceive the whole world by his miracle-working power. He will assume to personate the angels of light, to personate Jesus Christ. So far as his power extends, he will perform actual miracles, says the Scripture. And notice what Scripture she quotes, talking about Satan's personation of Christ. He deceiveth them that dwells on the earth by those means of those miracles which he had power to do. Where do we find that Scripture, guys? Revelation chapter 13. In the midst of the Sunday law, in the midst of the mark of the beast, you find this scripture. What is she saying? She's saying that God is showing her that this fire coming down from heaven on earth in the sight of men is referencing Satan's deceiving power of him personating Christ. Notice, so far as his power extends, he will perform actual miracles. Says the scriptures, he deceiveth them that dwell on earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do, not merely those which he what? Pretends to do. Something more than mere impostures is brought to view in the scripture. She says this is deeper than what we think. It's not just the beast. You know, when, in our church, historically, we teach that 
this passage is speaking about the Pentecostal movements, the charismatic movements. I came out of the charismatic movements, can't you tell? I came out of those movements. And I'm telling you right now, my friends, listen to me. They're not deceiving masses like this is talking about. Now, the charismatics, they, they get you in their culture. And then they kind of like, the way, the way it was used, and not, many of them probably mean well, don't get me wrong. But many of them, they get you in their culture, and they peer pressure you into getting up there and to being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in unknown, incoherent gibberish. And they think, that's what's going to take the world by storm and lead people astray? Get out of here with that. Come on now. I came out of that, guys. It didn't deceive me. It didn't deceive my family because we were sincerely trying to follow the Word of God. And most of that, that what you see in those charismatic churches is monkey see, monkey do. We had a pastor, we grown up, different people, and they would, when they would speak in tongues, they would say, see me, tie my tie, see me, tie my tie, see me, tie my tie. I'm like, is he asking us to see him tie his tie? I guess that's what popped in his head on that moment. Pastor Doug talks about certain churches he went to and they're shouting out names of Japanese motorcycles. Kawasaki Yamazuki, Kawasaki Yamazuki, Kawasaki Yamazuki. You get someone else up there and they'll say the same. They just think of whatever gibberish they can think of. And oftentimes they'll say, the Lord has given me a message. And it's the same tongue, the same incoherent gibberish that they say every single week. Minister I grew up with, he would say, Shukala Bosataya. I ain't no language. It's incoherent babblings. But he would get up there and he would say the same thing. And then a, a, a sister or a man would stand up over in the corner and they would say, Thus saith the Lord God. And it would be a different message every week. And I'm thinking, that brother said the same thing last week. And we got a totally different message. Something's not right here. Amen? Amen. That ain't deceiving the world. Come on with that. Now, there is real deceptions in those things. Don't get me wrong. But this ain't talking about some charismatic false revival. Listen to what she says. Speaking of Satan here in this passage in Revelation 13. He deceiveth him that dwells on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of beast. Now, she says, In the last days he will appear in such a manner as to make men believe him to be Christ, come the second time into the world. He will indeed transform himself into an angel of what? Of light. This is exactly what takes place. He will come personating Jesus Christ, working mighty miracles, and men will fall down and worship him as Jesus Christ. We shall be commanded to worship this being whom the world will glorify as Christ. Are you hearing me, guys? Now let's look at that. Revelation 13, we talked about a what? A fire. What is a fire a symbol of in the Bible? I think someone's phone's ringing. Okay, you're good. Just get it when you can. I know sometimes it's hard to get out of your purse or something. What is a fire a symbol of in the Bible? Let's, let's, take a, let's take a look, though. Let's take a look. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 24. For the Lord thy God is a what? Consuming fire, even a jealous God. Are you seeing this? Listen. It says here, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, 33. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? God is speaking out of the midst of the what? The fire. What is a fire symbol of? It's God's presence and Him speaking. It says here in Deuteronomy 9, 3, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is He which goeth over before thee as a consuming what? Fire. He shall destroy them. Do you see this? The fire that comes down from heaven, that's, by the way, let it, it's setting on earth in the sight of men. Are you guys seeing this? She just described it as representative of Satan's personation of Christ. 1 Kings 18, 24. This is, remember when the fire came down from heaven with Elijah, right? And call ye on the name of the gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So in this verse, what this is saying is that the God that answereth by fire, let him be the Lord. So the devil's taking this and he's saying, okay, I'm going to answer them by fire. I'm going to show them who I am. Notice Psalm 50 verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Who's Satan coming to personate? Christ. So Revelation 13 has a lot more depth to it than what we realize. This is from Last Day Events, page 167. Satan will come in to deceive, if possible, the very elect. 
He claims to be Christ, and he is coming in pretending to be the great medical missionary. He will cause fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men to prove that he is who? God. Right here, guys. It's amazing. This is from Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 62. In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ. And then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of our world. Because who is giving power to the papacy? It's Satan. So keep in mind, the power behind the power is Satan. He will, he will, uh, he will then, and then the law of God, rather, will be fully made void in the nation of our world. Rebellion against God's holy law will be fully ripe. But the true leader of all this rebellion is who? Satan, clothed in an, as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to the place of God and deify him. Notice what she goes on to say. Notice the chronology that what she goes on to say. But omnipotence, that's speaking of Jesus, will interpose and to the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan, the sentence will go forth. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. Stop. Did she just put Satan's personation of Christ before the plagues? She just said it. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. She's not getting, Lord, she's quoting scripture. She's not getting this, making this up out of nothing. She's in line with the word of God. Are you guys seeing this? Amen. This is what we just previously studied. This is why I started with the Bible, and now I'm going to these quotes so that you can see it from extra biblical source. Notice, last day events, page 166, paragraph 4. Wonderful scenes with which Satan will be closely connected will soon take place. God's word declares that Satan will work miracles. He will make people sick and then will suddenly remove from them his satanic power. They will then be regarded as healed. These works of apparent healing will, be, will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the... Is this on the test or not on the test? You tell me. It's on the test. But well, we got so many ministers right now preaching. This is only after the close of probation. Well, then it's not on the test. Amen? Well, if, if probation closes, we're already sealed. You know what Revelation 22, verse 11 says? Go there with me in your Bible quickly, if you don't mind. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. The moment probation closes, Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 will be proclaimed from heaven by God. The moment probation closes and judgment is fi final... This will be proclaimed from heaven by God. He that is unjust, let him be unjust. How often? Still. Still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy. How often? Still. Still. Does that mean it's final? Yes. God's saying it's final. Notice, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous. How often? Still. Still. And he that is holy, let him be holy. How often? Still. Still. Satan knows this. We know this. You think he's going to wait for you to get, be righteous still and then try to, okay, now it's my turn. He knows the scriptures better than all of us put together, guys. Moving on. Ooh, I'm about to get excited. Man, man, I forgot all about this part. Can you guys bear with me on the time? Please bear with me on the time. I know I've broken every law of the pew this morning. Have mercy. Praise God, that law's not in the Bible, though. Bear with me. I know those seats aren't very comfortable. I'm going to try to land this plane. Just bear with me here, because there's some important points i got to get. i got to get. Notice, third selected message is page 415. The scenes of the betrayal, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ have been reenacted and will again be reenacted on a what kind of scale? Immense. Immense scale. Now, we know this. We preach about this all the time. Preach about our prophecy seminar all the time. Does history tend to repeat itself? Yes. yes. Jesus warned his disciples, if this is what they do to me, this is what they'll do to you. He, he warned them. So check this out. Check this out. Understand something very significant. In Revelation, or uh, rather in, in, um, in the, the story of the cross, you read as Jesus is being taken into, into uh, prison, right? As he's, being, he's been uh, flogged, he's been beaten. They, they present him before the people, and then they bring out somebody else. Who do they bring out? What's his name? Barabbas. Do you remember Barabbas? Yeah. Tell me, what was about to close at the time for the nation of Israel? Guys, listen. Probation closed for the nation of Israel. At what date? 34 A.D. 
We study this in the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9. Okay? We know this. We study this. We, we, we know this backwards and forwards. But check this out. Probation is about to close for Israel. And then someone is presented before the church. Before the who? The church. The church. God's people that's supposed to accept him, that's supposed to follow him, that's supposed to believe in him. And, Bar and, and Pilate, keep in mind, Rome, yeah. church, state, yeah. they couldn't kill Jesus on their own. So the church had to unite with the state in order to be able to do that. Yeah. You following me? Yeah. So what happens? Pilate presents a prisoner, Barabbas. Barabbas. Now, probation's about to close for the nation of Israel, and Barabbas is brought on the scene. Can someone tell me here what the name Barabbas means? Woo! Did you guys hear those answers? Son of the Father. Is it possible before our probation closes, there's going to be another son of the Father brought to view for us to choose? A murderer that was from the beginning, though. Are you with me? Barabbas is presented to the church, and the church would have rather had him than to have the real Christ. Why? Because they had been what? Deceived, my friends. Listen to this quote from The Desire of Ages, page 733 what Ellen White says about Barabbas. It was customary at the, time, at, the, at the feast to release some one prisoner whom the people might choose. The Roman authorities at this time held a prisoner named Barabbas, who was under the sentence of death. Satan, by the way, is under the sentence of death. This man had claimed to be the who... He claimed authority to establish a different order of things to set the world right. Barabbas claimed to be the Messiah in his day. And the church chose the false Messiah over the true. Are you with me? Are you seeing? And this happened before the church's close of probation. Think I'm crazy yet? Under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatever he could obtain by theft and robbery was his own. He had done wonderful things through satanic agencies. He had gained a following among the people and had excited sedition against the Roman government. Under cover of, uh, under the cover, it's supposed to be a thee there, my bad. Under the cover of religious what? Enthusiasm. He was a hardened and desperate villain bent on rebellion and cruelty. Did you catch that? Oh, man. Hey, guys, I got to play a video. Do we have sound? I'm not hooked in. Am I supposed to be hooked in? So while he's figuring this out, I'm about to play you a video. What was going on in Jesus' time? The, the church was conflicted with liberals and conservatives. Do we see this happening today? Barabbas hated the Romans. He used politics to his advantage. Are you seeing this? He used politics to his advantage that he might be able to deceive, if possible, the very elect. We're good? So, so, so keep this in mind. Jesus stayed out of that. Do you see Jesus up in there debating the politicians? No, he stayed out of that because he was there to preach the gospel. So, so, so Barabbas was chosen because he was this great you know, Messiah figure that they were looking for to lead them in the onslaught against the Romans so they can declare independence from Rome and be Jerusalem once again. Right? Same thing's happening today. Right as we near the end of time. Do you know what's happening? During COVID, a new remarkable thing has happened. Churches were commanded to close. Right? A lot of people were unhappy about that. I was unhappy about that. Because we should have the freedom to worship God freely, right? So they closed down the services. They closed down worship. And I know that the idea of it was to keep people safe. 
But they told us there's going to be a window of time that we're going to have to do this, and then we can all meet back. But that didn't happen. Are you with me? During the time period when they finally did let people start meeting back, then they tell, tell you how to worship. Can't sing. How many of you heard that one? You can't sing. Now, guys, listen. Jesus said, he that is faithful in little is faithful in how much? In much. So, so in the last days, what's it, what is it all about? Worship. When we give in to something like that, how do you think we're going to respond when the big test comes? When you can't even sing a song for Jesus because you ain't got no faith. You can get mad at me if you want to. If anyone's toes are stepped on, hey, we can have a foot massaging service afterwards. <laughs> but it's true. I'm about being safe. Amen? I'm not about being unsafe. We should be safe and we should be smart. Follow the protocol. Don't come around if you're sick and all that. I get that. But let's not let our doubt and our fear... God says, I'm not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Don't let our fear impact how we worship God. And that's exactly what the church did. Even our church. Walking in services that, oh, we can't sing today. I'm in Arkansas, but what do you mean we can't sing today? Yes, we're not supposed to sing. People get sick. Why are we here then? Are we not here to worship God? Amen? A whole lot of mess went on. And what happened is that the church got mad. How many of you got mad during COVID? Come on now. Be honest. You're like, man, that's so sick of this stuff. I'm ready for all this. You started getting angry. Well, all of the churches and the people inside Christianity that have stayed out of politics, guess what they started to do now? Uh-uh. Not anymore. You turn on every television show these days, and what do you see? LGBTQ plus stuff being pushed in your face. It's like a law now on Netflix and many of these you know, streaming services that you can't be, you can't even have a show unless you're inclusive to the LGBTQ plus community for a major character to have a role on the show. And it's just being shoved. It's everywhere. You go in Target. You go in all the Walmart now. Have mercy. It's everywhere. It's being pushed. And these Christians are saying, man, this is an educational system that I don't appreciate a belief that's being pushed in the school systems, everywhere, being taught, it's a religion, it's being taught. And I don't appreciate that. Christians are mad. Christians are tired of it. Christians are sick of it. And they mean well, but what they're doing is right what Satan wants them to do. You see, who pushed who first in Daniel 11, 40 through 45? The king of the south pushed. King of the south said, what's up, boy? And the king of the north fell down a little bit and was like, oh. And then they were, Phew. We've stayed out of politics too long. We've, we've, we've messed with you guys too long. We've allowed you to do what you want too long. And now it's time for a new order of things. You think this isn't coming? This birthed a whole nother problem that I'm about to prove to you in this video. Christian nationalism. How many of you heard of Christian nationalism? Oh, let me tell you something, boy. This is a new thing, and it has got... It, it, while the rest of the world is on some donkeys riding around, Christian nationalism is on an Arabian, like, beast. <laughs> and it means business. Don't believe me? Watch the video. Here we go. All right, hold on with me. It's coming out of my computer. Oh, put my mic on it? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Let me hold my mic up to it and see if it's a word. We have another microphone right here? Have mercy. Sorry, guys, I forgot to tell them about this video here. You got to see this video, though. I know we went long today. You guys got to see this. All right. You may have to turn it up a little extra loud. Oh, come on now. All right, here we go. In America, that have been separated. The conservatives, this 
is where the real Holy Spirit resistance is going to show up. There are two streams in America that have been separated, the conservatives and the revivalists. The devil has told to those in the church, don't make any political comments. The devil has told those in the conservative movement, stay out of the churches. But those two forces, when they come together, all things are possible. We must go after this nation through righteous leaders and government laws, but we must also do it with the authority he has given us in the spirit to deal with the serpent and say, they're going to represent us in Washington, but we're going into our closet and we're going to run you out of our garden. Yeah. And I'm pronounced and I decree and declare the fire of God. The fire of which the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy in this nation and streams in America that have been separated, the conservatives and the revivalists. One has been in the political camp, the other has been working in the church. The devil has told those in the church, don't make any political comments. The devil has told those in the conservative movement, stay out of the churches. But those two forces, when they come together, I'm going to try it again. Those two forces, when they come together, together yeah. 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 and all things are possible. We must do, we must marry these two uh, arenas, the yeah. civil and the sacred. They are not separate in scripture. Nope. The prophets, the men of God, the priests work with the governors and the kings. God never intended for it to be separate. We must go after this nation through righteous leaders and government laws, but we must also do it with the authority he has given us in the spirit to deal with the serpent and say, they're going to represent us in Washington, but we're going into our closet and we're going to run you out of our garden. America to our Judeo-Christian heritage and reestablish a biblically based culture. That's, that's what my goal is. There's no such thing as the separation of church and state. The First Amendment is to keep the uh, state out of the church. And, he's and they're talking about the United States of America. Talking about the United States of America because when Matthew mentioned it in the Bible, he wasn't talking about the physical ground that he was on. He was talking about something in the distance. So if we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, one nation under God and one religion under God. I believe that the separation of church and state was not for the state, not for the church not to get involved in the state. It was to keep the state out of the church. Jesus was involved in politics. The Bible is completely involved in politics. You have King David who was involved in politics. Daniel the prophet was more of a governor than he was a prophet. He was more of a governor. He was a political figure. Nehemiah, the one in rebuilding and restructuring the wall and the broken down Israel, uh, was being a very political figure in his time. And here's another thing. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who's going to come back on this earth for a thousand years and reign on this earth a thousand years, is a political figure. And the government shall be on his shoulder, according to Isaiah 9. We are going to impose Christian values in America again, whether you like it or not. That is precisely what we intend to do, is to impose Christian laws on everyone in the United States of America. We have to make sure that our normative laws and the laws that are passed by the government reflect the natural and the moral laws written by God. But the most telling thing, and I want you to listen to this, is when Elijah said on the mountain, he had the power to call for a national conversation. Let's get everyone together, everyone that matters, 
everyone of influence come to the mountain and we're going to ask for fire we're going to decide who god is is it baal or is it jehovah we're going to find out that which the devil has come to steal kill and destroy in this nation and this state we stretch our hands with god and we command fire You guys see that? Christian nationalism is taking over. How many of you glad we, you came this morning? Now you're here this evening, and we're about to wrap it up, so believe me. <laughs> All right, let's get right to it. This is the major, pal- this is the end. We're landing the plane now. Right? We're, actually, we're actually about to land on the airstrip. Just be patient while everybody's standing up and they're waiting to get their bags. Okay. Notice what Ellen White says here in the Great Controversy. Now, the Great Controversy is one of her greatest works that God gave her to do. She said, this is the book we should put in the hand of every single Christian possible. Because it goes through the whole story of everything that we study in Bible prophecy seminars. Boom! The whole nine yards. Listen to what she says. Page 624, paragraph 2. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. While they're asking for fire, while they want fire, and they're asking for a sign, Satan will answer. He will make it appear that Christ has come In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come! Christ has come! The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed His disciples when He was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, and yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, He presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then is assumed. Uh, and then in His assumed character of Christ, He claims to have changed the Sabbath to what? Sunday, and commands all to hallow the day which He has blessed. There are some issues that I've seen with this, with our brothers and sisters who teach that this is after the close of probation. As I was reading this passage, I thought, this is incongruent with the rest of the chapter. It doesn't make any sense. Why would she put this after the close of probation? Because notice what she says here. That he heals the diseases of the people, and then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the, day, the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. If this is after the close of probation, that means the plagues would have fallen. He ain't healing them of the plagues. He's not healing the boils. He's not able to, to, to soothe their scorching skin from the fourth plague. Can somebody say amen? The next one is that he says he commands them all to hallow the day which he has blessed. If probation's already closed... How could they hallow a day that they've already hallowed? Why would he be saying this if probation's already closed? So this made me think. I thought something's not right here because our brothers and sisters, ministers, even whom I respect in the church, who's teaching and promulgating that Satan's going to personate Christ after the close of probation, it doesn't make any sense for her to say these words with the crowning act passage. But she continues... He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming His name by refusing to listen to His angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Notice she's calling it a delusion because probation hasn't closed yet. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes from the last to the greatest give heed to these sorceries, saying, this is the great power of God. Now, you guys see the quote. Why do so many people, though, believe Satan's personation of Christ is after the close of probation? You know why? It's because of the great controversy chapter that we just read, the passage from the chapter we just read. 
but not just the passage, but the entire chapter. It's chapter 39 in the book of the Great Controversy, titled The Time of Trouble. Everyone has been reading this chapter in the Great Controversy chronologically. What did I say? Chronologically. Chronologically. She doesn't write this chapter chronologically, though. And I literally spent four and a half hours yesterday reading through this chapter backwards and forwards to make sure I was not wrong. She doesn't write this chronologically. Notice, I'm going to give you the chronology of how she writes this and the the themes that she writes this. Notice, she begins the chapter with intercession ceasing or the close of probation. She talks about how probation closes, intercession ceases. In other words, Jesus stops being the intercessor because judgment's final. And now he's pouring out the plagues, right? So, so she begins the chapter with intercession ceasing and probation closing. That's on page 613. By the time she gets to page 615, she starts talking about God's presence withdrawn from the Jewish nation. She correlates the close of probation to the nation of Israel. Are you with me? Then she explains the time of Jacob's trouble. Remember when Jacob was going back to meet his brother Esau? He was going back to meet his brother Esau and he was having that... You know, he was in agony, and he had that wrestling match with God. He was trying to figure out, like, man, how, my brother has an army coming up against me. He's going to try to kill me. And he was in a time of trouble. She says that in God's people, when intercession ceases, they're going to be looking, thinking about their life and saying, God, I, I pray that I'm right with you. God, I pray that I'm, I haven't sinned, that I've confessed all my sin. They're going to be in a time of trouble as well. But then she changes gears. So the first three parts is chronology, chronological. But then she changes gears, and now she switches back, and she starts speaking directly to the people of her day and the people that will live to see these these calamities and these great deceptions come. And she gives a warning to the people who live when? Now. Now, to overcome Satan's delusions. So now she switches gears, and she starts giving the warning for everyone that's living in the world now, before these things come. And then she warns of false Christ. And that page that we just read, that passage we just read in page 624, she talks about Satan's personification of Christ, the crowning act of the deception. But then, notice, number six, she then talks about, right after following the personation of Christ, persecution coming upon God's people, the death decree comes, and then she gives God's people hope during that time period. And then the seventh seventh point here, the end of the chapter, notice what she ends with again. Intercession ceasing and the probation closing, and then she introduces the seven last plagues. So notice, she breaks it up in the middle of the chapter, and she starts talking about a warning for God's people now, and then she goes back through the scenes. Satan personifies Christ. Uh, Persecution and death decree will come. She gives God's people hope. She talks about intercession ceasing, probation closing, and then the seven last plagues coming upon planet Earth. She places in this same chapter that everybody's confusing, probation closing and the seven last plagues coming after Satan personifies Christ, after the crowning act. But the reason why everybody's got this confused, uh, even people, loved ones that I have at Amazing Facts, my, my colleagues and peers, even some of them, the reason why they got this all confused is because they read the beginning of the chapter and she starts with intercession ceasing and probation closing and they think, oh, so everything, the rest of this chapter... It's chronological. That means everything that happens after this is after the intercession ceasing. But it's not. She goes back and gives another warning. Is everybody with me? Amen. Amen. All right. We've landed the plane. This is my niece and nephew, Gavin and Trinity. Uh, Really, really sweet um, niece and nephew I have. I'm so thankful for the both of them. But uh, then this picture that you see here, they're both holding a $20 bill. Some time ago I told them, I said... I said, guys, I said, listen, the world has got all these other things to try to get you to earn money. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You guys need a little money? And they're like, yeah, I need a little money, Uncle Dakota. We'll we'll clean your truck. We'll do this. I said, I'll do that. I said, I want to reward you for something that will pay in the long run, something that's much greater than money. I said, but I'll give you a little bit of money if you can do this. And they said, well, what? I said, if you memorize a Bible scripture in just a week, just one Bible scripture, I said, I'll give you $20. That's a pretty good deal, huh? My mom and dad would have gave me that deal. I'd have been memorizing all kinds of scripture. But I told them that, and they're like, "Okay, all right, I'm going to go to code a bet. We'll do it. Bet. We'll do it." I said, "All right." They said, "What scripture you want us to memorize?" I said, "John 14:21." Jesus says, "He that has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, 
and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Beautiful scripture. I wanted them to remember that if they're obedient to God, God says, I will manifest myself to you. Amen? I wanted them to remember that. So I gave this, uh, this scripture to them, and a week goes by. I show up. It's judgment day. I show up, and I pull my, my truck up in the yard, and they immediately, I could see through because they had the screen door wide open, and I could see through the screen door, and they jump up from the couch. They say, oh, no, Brother Dakota's here. And they run back to their rooms, and they grab their Bibles, and they say, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he, as soon as I walked to the door, I said, ah, ah, ah. I said, ah. I said, probation has closed. <laughs> Judgment is here. I said, ah, come on. So I pulled them aside one by one, and I told them, I said, all right, Trinity, you're first. You're the oldest. Go first. Quote the scripture, and you get $20. He who has my commandments, um, uh, and you know when you start hearing ums and uhs that she don't know the scripture, right? So I said, I said, you don't know it, do you? And she goes, she goes, no, Uncle Dakota, I don't. I said, well, I can't give you this twenty dollars and reward nothing. I said, okay, step outside. Gavin comes in the room. I said, Gavin, go ahead and tell me the scripture. He who has my commandments, um, that's about all they had. And notice how long did I give them? A week. That's a long time to memorize one scripture. That's kind of part of the problem. And I learned a lesson myself through this. I said, guys, and I, took, I set both of them down. I said, you know, I, I really wanted to give you this $20. I, they have no idea how much I wanted to give them the reward. I want to so bad, but I can't reward nothing. And so I told them, I said, I'll tell you what. I'm just going to give you 24 hours. you got 24 hours. Jesus gave us a second chance on the cross. I'm going to give you a second chance. 24 hours. I said, and then after that, that's it. I leave. I pray with them. I leave and I go home. Come back the next morning. And it was a totally different scene. So beautiful. I'll never forget it. Gavin and Trinity both, they bust through the front door as soon as they see me pull up. Uncle Dakota, Uncle Dakota, we got it memorized. We got it memorized. When before they didn't know, they were running in terror. <laughs> but it's something interesting when you know the word of God and judgment day comes, you ain't scared. Amen. And someone say amen? amen. And they, they ran and I was just so happy. I said, well, praise God. I'm so happy for the both of you. I said, I got, I got the reward here. I got your $20. I said, let's see if you know it. Took them in one by one, verbatim. Amen. Amen. Quoted me the scripture. I said, praise God. I said, I'm so happy and excited. And I gave them the money. And there's something I learned along the way. I learned that Jesus Christ wants to reward you and I so bad. But he can't reward nothing. Who says amen? amen? When we have a lot of time, we waste it. But when time grows short... We start taking things serious. Oh, it's amazing what seven week or seven days did for them and what 24 hours did for them. When I came to see the smiles on their faces, Jesus can't wait to see the smile on your face when He comes back in all this power and glory. Will you be ready? Will you have a relationship with Him? The whole purpose of this message this morning is not to come off dogmatic. It's not to come off like I got it all figured out, because I certainly don't. I'm still studying. But I hope and pray that we will not be so trusting in ourselves and our own intellectual understanding that when that judgment day comes, we are deceived by not trusting in God and His Word, following it, but by getting a little too cocky and arrogant in our own intellectual knowledge that we become deceived. If it's your desire this morning, you say, man, I want to be prepared for Christ's coming. I don't want to be playing around. We can sit and watch two-hour movies, but some of us in our hearts right now, we're complaining about how long I've preached. I know. We don't have theater seats in here like the theaters do. But oh, the seats in heaven is going to be a lot more comfortable than these pews. Jesus is coming again. I want to be ready. I want to appeal to you this morning. If you need to renew your Christian walk, 
And you need a new revelation of the majesty of God. Jesus says like he says to Peter. Come. And give your life to Christ. Submit yourself to him. And he will see you through to the end. You will not be deceived. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this truth. We thank you, Lord, for endurance this morning. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to get my suit dry cleaned now. Sweat is straight through it, Lord. But I'm so grateful, Lord, that your word is so powerful. And that, Lord, we can be so excited about your word that we can actually share it. And that we can be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Lord, we know the time is coming soon upon planet Earth where everything we've studied is going to take place. And we are going to have to look in the face of the millions and millions and millions of people that have been deceived and tell them that is not Jesus. That's Satan. Lord, we're going to sound crazy. We're going to sound lunatic. We're going to sound like we've lost our minds. But Lord, the message that you give us to preach cannot go forward while we have a shaky, crooked backbone. So God, we need you to please plant within us a backbone of godliness, a backbone of holiness, to change our lives, God, forevermore. We are so thankful for your love towards us. Be with us, Lord, today, the rest of this evening. Help us to enjoy our fellowship lunch. And Lord, for those who might be struggling with this message, I pray, God, you will convict their heart and mind. As we have conversations, Lord, we will be like you. Keep studying to show ourselves approved. 